Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension here at UW-Madison. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, uh, Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. And speaking of 50, <laughs> tonight we have a very, very joyous event to celebrate, hence my happy shirt. From the summer of 69, the 50th anniversary of the landing on the moon by the folks on Apollo 11. Uh, Jaime Cordova is here. He's from the Department of Genetics. He's also a NASA Solar System Ambassador. Uh, he's going to be talking with us about the next giant leap, excuse me, the next giant leap from the Apollo program through life sciences research for the journey to Mars. Jaime was born in Linwood, California, and he went to Warren High School in Downey, California. Then he went to Cal State Long Beach, where he studied molecular and cell biology, and is here as a PhD genetics uh, student in the Pernan lab. Uh, you'll notice, if you saw the picture that Jaime had that we promoted, it was in front of the Griffith Observatory. And that place is famous for many things, but at least two big movies. One was Rebel Without a Cause, and the other more recent, La La Land. And I think that really makes Jaime special. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Jaime Cordova to Wednesday Night at the Lab. All right, can you guys hear me? All right, cool, awesome. All right, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for thank you all for being here. It's uh, really a privilege uh, to be here to speak to you all. Um, my Wednesday night at the lab is a little bit different, as I hope you can all tell, and some of you have already told me. Um, I did not work on Apollo. I am much too young to have worked on Apollo. Um, so, uh, so I won't be speaking about my own work, uh, which made it a little difficult uh, when Tom asked me to uh, share a personal connection. So I thought, well, you know. What can I share? So um, I figured, I, or after a lot of thinking, I realized that I had two connections. Excuse me. Uh, my first connection uh, was uh, really in terms of my love for flight and my love for space flight. Um, as far as I can remember, I've always you know, been fascinated by flight. I have a scar right here from a, uh, metal, from a metal toy plane that someone gave me when I was like four years old, which is a great gift to give a four-year-old, right? Uh, something I could easily cut myself with. Um, my mom loves telling that story, um, so that, I, <laughs> that I did that. Um, beyond that, uh, as time progressed, I remember another recollection is second grade, uh, laying down in the room of my floor with a stack of books on all the planets, uh, including Pluto, uh, with all the planets there. Um, and I remember just being so fascinated, and as uh, time progressed, my Second grade teacher, he noticed that I had a real interest in science and uh, particularly in the planets. And actually, I forgot to mention, my love for flight uh, continued on for a long time where I actually ended up, I grew up underneath the LAX uh, final approach path and this is one of my favorite planes, uh, the Lufthansa 747. Just wanted to mention that. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, so anyways, back to the original story is uh, my second grade teacher noticed I had a real love for science and for, uh, for astronomy. Uh, so he gave me this book, uh, which I actually still have at home. Um, I remember two distinct memories about this book. One was crying my eyes out uh, when I was reading about black holes because I was so scared I was going to die soon, uh, despite, <laughs> despite people telling me that the sun wasn't going to die for another five billion years, and even then, now knowing that uh, it won't turn into a black hole. Uh, my second memory um, is reading about the space shuttle and reading about, uh, you know, uh, uh, crews going up to space. And I remember thinking just how cool it was that every once in a while people would occasionally get to go into space. Um, I started watching the, uh, all the space shuttle launches. Unfortunately, there was a time where there weren't any um, because I started watching them shortly before the Columbia disaster. Um, but my love for space uh, continued and uh, I eventually started asking my parents, I was like, hey, you know what, I, you know, I really want a book on space because around that time I still didn't really know how to use the internet. So. Uh, my, you know, good old books, and I actually still have the book that they gave me. 
um, and this is uh, or that they that I got at the book fair that I asked them to buy me. Um, and what was cool about this book is it just had so much information um, on the planets, on uh, crewed missions, uh, things like that. Um, my love for astronomy, and uh, and that's really where my love for for astronomy and for space flight kind of took off. No pun intended. Um, after high school, uh, I started volunteering at the California Science Center uh, with the Space Shuttle Endeavor, um, and I was there for about five years before I actually moved here to Madison. Uh, along with being there, uh, I was working at a job uh, at a paint store, and I got tired of selling paint. So what I ended up doing is uh, I wanted to switch a job. Uh, and by chance, when I was deciding that I really wanted to quit that job uh, for a variety of reasons, um, it was I uh, ran into an application for the Griffith Observatory. And I started working there a little bit over three years ago. Um, and that's really you know, kind of where, uh, where it all took off. And it's really you know, thanks to this book. Um, and one of my favorite things about this book is, well, one, it was published in 2000, um, but in here it says that the James Webb Space Telescope is supposed to be launching by 2007. <laughs> now, the people who laughed understood why that's funny. That's because the James Webb Space Telescope hasn't launched yet. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's 12 years overdue, and the reason why it's overdue is really because launching things into space is hard. Um, along with not only you know space telescopes and satellites, but sending humans is hard uh, into space. Um, so, but you know we love the challenge. We love the challenge of going into space. And uh, when President Kennedy, almost 60 years ago, challenged the nation, uh, we decided to take on that. Say the book. Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask. Why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? <laughs> we choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Now, with uh, President Ch Kennedy's challenge uh, to the nation and to NASA, it led to the development of Project Apollo. And this is where my second connection comes in. Uh, no, I'm not a Kennedy. And again, no, I didn't work on Apollo. Um, but with the, with the project, with NASA getting this challenge and deciding to hopefully take humans to the moon, uh, they decided to hire a large number of contractors. One in particular, or one special to me, uh, is North American Walk Rockwell, uh, which, or, or sorry, North American Aviation, which eventually became North American Rockwell, uh, which was, uh, their plant was in Downey, uh, my hometown. Uh, and actually, here's a picture from the uh, museum there, that's the Colum Columbia Memorial Space Center, which uh, has a boilerplate from the Apollo era outside. Um, the command and service module were actually built there, uh, which is, again, that's why it's kind of special to me, because it's, uh, it's an, I kind of grew up there for the past couple of years. And uh, for a long time, I actually didn't know this took place there until I really started getting into deep into the, into the weeds of, of the history of Downey. Uh, but this was just one of the centers. Excuse me. Uh, this was just one of the centers. As you saw on that map, there were, uh, there were so many contractors who were actually working on the, on the Apollo program. And well over 400,000 people uh, worked on it um, to get man to the moon. Now, uh, as, as many of you may know, um, or I'm sure you, may, you probably know, uh, is the project actually ended almost shortly before it even got started. Um, and that's because of its tragic beginnings. Uh, that's with Apollo 1, uh, with uh, Gus Grissom, Edward White, and Roger Chaff. Uh, the launch was planned for February 21st, uh, 1967. But unfortunately, the crew perished on January 27th, 1967. <coughs> oh, didn't play how it was supposed to. Let me try that again. There we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so there was, uh, there was a fire aboard uh, the capsule, and uh, the launch crew was not able to get to them in time, unfortunately. Uh, this tragic accident ended up sending NASA back to the drawing board. Now, uh, send, uh, sending them back to the drawing board and also putting the managed program uh, to a stop. Now, during the, uh, before the mission, the crew expressed several concerns, and this is actually at the uh, North American Aviation Plant in Downey. Uh, the crew expressed several concerns about the capsule, uh, including that it had a lot of combustible material on the inside, uh, it was pressurized with 100% oxygen on the, uh, here on, on Earth, and uh, the capsule door didn't have uh, any explosive bolts, 
Uh, so they were, and they weren't. They also weren't able to actually open it from the inside, meaning that only people on the outside can open it. Uh, but NASA decided to approve the launch anyway, um, and uh, because of that, uh, the astronauts decided to take this relatively or this pretty cryptic picture where they were praying to, uh, where they were praying uh, with the Apollo capsule right next to it, um, and unfortunately, uh, disaster struck. As I mentioned, uh, NASA put a stop to the uh, manned mission to the manned missions. Uh, but they continued with unmanned tests, uh, dubbed Apollo 4, 5, and 6. Uh, first is Apollo 4, which was the first uh, test of the, Saturn, of the new Saturn V launch vehicle. Apollo 1 was uh, used the Saturn 1B vehicle. Uh, then, uh, and this was unmanned, I should say, again. Uh, then came Apollo 5, which was the first test uh, of the lunar module. This was, again, using a Saturn 1B. And then finally, the final test was Apollo 6, which used uh, the Saturn V again. Now, with this, uh, with this particular mission, it carried a payload that was approximately 80% uh, of the payload of a full Apollo mission. Um, at some point during the launch, uh, something went wrong. It still made it into space, but it didn't go into its planned orbit. Um, because of that, you know, some people didn't totally feel comfortable with the Saturn V still, but NASA decided that because Apollo 4 had worked so successfully, um, they decided to, to, they were confident to use it in crewed missions. And during this time, uh, the Apollo capsule had been improved um, and the concerns of uh, Apollo 1 had been addressed, including, uh, as you can see right here, the, or one of the many things was uh, the door being able to be opened from the inside. And the reason behind this, actually, uh, the reason behind this is NASA really didn't want uh, their astronauts' lives to go in vain. And I've been researching all of this, which I learned a lot about the Apollo missions more than I ever thought I would. Uh, I ran into this quote from Gus Grissom that the conquest of space is worth the risk of life. And NASA, again, was determined to not let their lives go in vain. So 20 months later uh, came Apollo 7, uh, which carried Don Easel, uh, Wally Shira, and Walter Cunningham. Uh, this was the first successful launch uh, uh, of, a, of a, cr a crewed launch into space for the Apollo program. And this used a Saturn 1B. Uh, this was meant to place the, the new capsule under test, and fortunately, it worked out. Um, in addition to also being, in addition to being the first uh, capsule test, excuse me, it was also the first TV broadcast of Americans from space. Um, and despite the astronauts really not wanting to do it, uh, they dubbed it the Walt Wally and Don Show. <laughs> so yeah, so they really didn't want to do it, and uh, as you can see, it didn't all work out, uh, you know, you were, some of you were able to read, but not all of it. Um, a couple of uh, months later came Apollo 8, uh, which ended up going beyond Earth. Uh, this carried Frank Borman II, William Anders, and former UW Badger James Lavelle Jr. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, uh, James Lavelle came here to the University of Wisconsin uh, before, traveling, or before transferring to the Naval Academy. Uh, this mission uh, was uh, considered the Christmas mission because it launched on December 21st. And as you can tell by the mission patch, it was the first crewed spacecraft to actually go beyond Earth orbit and to the moon. And this actually also was the first launch of the Saturn V rocket. Um, the, or it was originally planned to be uncrewed, um, but because of the success of the prior missions and growing concern that the Soviet Union would potentially put a man into orbit first, uh, they decided to turn this into a crewed mission after all. And uh, what this resulted in, or what the goal of this particular mission was, was again, not only to test uh, the Saturn V and to go into that orbit, but also to uh, take high resolution pictures of uh, potential landing sites. Um, and this mission was considered a success uh, that allowed the astronauts to go into lunar orbit, uh, making them the first to escape uh, Earth's gravity and along with also being um, the first to use uh, Saturn V uh, rocket, or a crewed Saturn V. Um, and another one of the many results of this image is uh, something that you all may be very familiar with, which is the iconic Earthrise image. It's a very beautiful picture. Uh, then next came Apollo 9. And by the way, I'm just going to do a quick little review of all the Apollo missions. So to go through the whole history, 
Uh, then next came Apollo 9, uh, which this, the goal of this was to put the lunar module uh, to the test. This carried James McDivitt, uh, David Scott, and Rusty Strakehart. The mission launched on March 3rd, and unlike Apollo 8, uh, this actually was an Earth orbiting mission, so they didn't go around, uh, they didn't go around the moon. Uh, this was the first uh, crewed mission of the lunar module, and actually the lunar module was originally supposed to go on, uh, on Apollo 8, but there were, when it was delivered, there were several defects, and NASA basically decided, finally, that uh, we shouldn't launch something that may be a little defective. Um, so, <laughs> um, and I, sorry, that sounded a lot shadier than I thought, than it should have. Um, the, crew uh, the crew tested uh, various docking and undocking maneuvers, um, and along with performing uh, the, uh, an extra vehicular activity. Um, so yeah. Then finally came Apollo 10, which uh, was one last practice, as I like to call it. Uh, this carried uh, Gene Cernan, Thomas Stafford, and John Young. Uh, the mission launched just two months after Apollo 9 uh, with, on May 18th, and this was NASA's final dress rehearsal before the, loon, uh, the lunar landing. Uh, they were really starting to pick up speed, and again, it was exceptionally critical for this mission to be successful uh, because uh, it was the last time that they got to practice, essentially. Um, fortunately, it was a success, and they did everything but, going, but actually landing on the moon. Uh, two months later, 50 years ago yesterday, Came the nation uh, came the day that the nation and the world was awaiting. Apollo 11 uh, launched at 8.32 uh, a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and as you'll see throughout the presentation, and maybe along these walls, you guys may have noticed the Wisconsin State Journal. Um, I spent a couple of hours at the archives making sure that I, that I got some of these pictures for, uh, to show to you all. Um, but yeah, it launched, on, it launched uh, July 16th, 1969 at 8.32 a.m. Eastern Time. And for those of you who may not, be, who may not know, um, I strongly recommend uh, CBS is actually replaying all of Walter Cronkite's coverage, which you'll hear me mention uh, a little bit throughout the presentation. So Apollo 11's destination was the moon, and arguably carrying the most famous astronauts, which I probably don't even have to tell you, uh, Neil Armstrong, uh, Michael Collins, and Buzz Aldrin. Uh, as I mentioned, the mission launched on uh, July 16th, and it lasted through July 24th, with the goal of uh, being the first human moon landing and uh, having Armstrong step on the moon. They traveled for a little bit over uh, three days before actually reaching the moon's orbit on July 19th with the goal of landing in the Sea of Tranquility. And uh, it, if you're not familiar, this is the side, that faces, this, this side of the moon that faces us. Uh, Armstrong and Aldrin went into the lunar module on July 20th at approximately 1.11 Eastern time, and, or 1.11 p.m. Eastern time. And I tried very hard to find, I went into like five archives to try and find more pictures of them before they actually touched down, and I could not find anything. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, but yeah, they went into the lunar module on July 20th. Um, and then uh, Michael Collins actually stayed on the command module. Uh, he's often called the loneliest, or referred to as the loneliest person in the universe, but he said multiple times, including in a very recent interview, which I believe was yesterday, was just published yesterday, uh, that he actually wasn't lonely at all. He actually enjoyed the peace and quiet uh, of being up there by himself. Um, I'm sure, you know, throughout the stress of the mission, <laughs> uh, he, he says that he uh, would drink coffee while he was up there and uh, would occasionally get to listen to music during his free time. And he would especially get some peace and quiet during the uh, occasional 40 minutes that he lost control, uh, that he lost contact with mission control, which I'm sure was nice. <laughs> um, uh, the astronauts, or Aldrin and Armstrong, started uh, their descent onto the moon. Um, it was actually not a very, not a smooth descent, and this is something I just recently learned. Um, there were a series of, of anomalies that happened during the landing, uh, including uh, alarms going off, um, and they started running out of fuel. Uh, so they had to, yeah, they had to take over a, a manual landing, and it actually ended up uh, being that they uh, were off target by a couple of miles. Um, but eventually, at 3.17 p.m. Eastern Time on July 20th, 1969, 50 years ago this Saturday, they made history. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. 
<laughs> now, um, as I mentioned, uh, I already mentioned, uh, you know, CBS replaying Walter Cronkite's coverage, and I was watching it yesterday, and I think he described it best. Uh, man's dream, and I quote, Man's dream and a nation's pledge has now been fulfilled. The lunar age had begun. Uh, this nation and the, it was a moment that changed the nation and the world. Uh, from what I understand, about 650 million people around the world paused what they were doing to watch the historic moment. Um, in watching a couple of interviews, Armstrong and Aldrin mentioned that they didn't actually have a lot of emotion. They just kind of smiled at each other, a little smile of satisfaction, uh, and then they shook hands. Um, after having landed on the moon for about, or after being on the moon for about six hours, uh, that's actually uh, when Armstrong uttered his most famous phrase. Now, someone had already mentioned, has already mentioned to me <laughs> before the presentation started, did he say one small step for a man or one small step for man? From what I understand and from what I, me listening to it, I heard one small step for man. Uh, but he says that he had intended to say one small step for a man. It's up for debate. I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go with what he said on the video. So, <laughs> um, but yeah. They were on the moon for about 21, uh, for a little bit over 21 hours, so 21 hours and 36 minutes. Uh, their EVA, or their extravehicular activity, uh, was about two and a half hours, however. So that's probably the amount of time it took you to get here, watch this, go home, and uh, times two. Uh, and in Los Angeles, that's how long it would take me just to get to work. So, uh, so yeah. <laughs> Um, during the, while they were there, Armstrong set up, uh, Armstrong and Aldrin set up the early Apollo scientific package uh, near the lunar module, and this was a scientific package that would be replicated throughout the other Apollo missions uh, with the goal of basically gathering the same measurements, um, gathering the same measurements throughout all the different landing sites. Now, one of the, one of the experiments on the left uh, is the passive seismic experiment, uh, which is used to detect moonquakes um, to hopefully provide uh, in, um, information on the interior structure of the moon. Uh, this is the first time that a seismometer had ever been placed on another world. And I'll just throw a quick plug that uh, there has been, a, there is a, a seismometer was placed last year on a second world. Uh, the InSight mission to Mars uh, placed a seismometer there, and you can actually go online and listen to some of the uh, to some of the recordings and listen to the wind of, uh, to the sound of Mars. Uh, additionally, on the right uh, was a laser ranging retro reflector, uh, where this was used to measure the distance between the moon and Earth, uh, and uh, really not only determine the distance between the moon and Earth, but also determine at what rate the moon is moving away from us. Uh, so as every year the moon moves about one and a half inches away from us, uh, meaning that in maybe 500 million years is the is the estimate I saw. Uh, we won't have total solar eclipses, uh, so they'll all be annular eclipses. So enjoy them while you can. The next one, <laughs> the next one here in the United States is uh, April 2024. So uh, you only have to drive a little bit south to see it. Um, and this, uh, from what I understand, this uh, retro reflector is still being used, if I remember correctly. In addition to that, uh, they also set up the solar wind experiment, uh, which was used to collect solar wind particles. So it was essentially figure a sheet of aluminum foil to collect uh, solar wind particles um, and so they could return it uh, to Earth for analysis. And this is impossible here on Earth thanks to our lovely magnetic fields that help protect us from the solar wind and also give us beautiful auroras, which we can apparently occasionally see here in Madison. Um, 
And uh, another quick mention, so the solar wind is, is just basically high energy particles that travel throughout the solar system. And that solar wind is actually why Mars doesn't have an atmosphere. It doesn't have a magnetic field to protect it from the solar wind, so its atmosphere was stripped uh, billions of years ago. And finally, another main goal of the mission was to collect lunar samples uh, to understand the moon's history. Uh, on Apollo 11, uh, Armstrong and Aldrin collected about 50 pounds uh, worth of rocks and soil samples, and some of these apparently are, uh, are still unopened, uh, and they're all housed at the Johnson Kennedy, uh, or I'm sorry, <laughs> at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Um, and you can actually watch a video online. It's like a bank vault, essentially, uh, to actually get in there. Now, this was important not only for NASA, but it was actually also had a, had a local connection. Uh, there were two professors here at the university, uh, Eugene, I was supposed to be able to read that, Eugene Cameron and Larry Haskin, uh, who were chosen to actually analyze uh, this, uh, these uh, soil samples and the rock samples. Um, I didn't run into any of their data, but uh, that a uh, couple of Wisconsin connections. Uh, they left various mementos, uh, such as pictures of families, uh, messages from nation's leaders, and this plaque, and of course the famous flag. And a fun fact is that I believe this, was, this flag was bought at Sears. Um, <laughs> it was either bought at Sears, and that's what, I, that's what I read, it was either bought at Sears or it was made by someone from Milwaukee. Um, so there's two kind of conflicting stories. Uh, essentially, NASA didn't want a repeat of Tang. Uh, and if you guys are familiar with that story. Um, so yeah, the crew remained on the moon for about 21 hours and 36 minutes uh, before actually launching off the moon. Uh, and they took off from the moon at 12.54 p.m. on July 21st and docked with the command module approximately three hours later. Uh, they returned uh, to Earth, heroes to all mankind. And a couple more Wisconsin connections is, uh, you can see here that they returned, on, as I mentioned, on July 24th. Well, something interesting, uh, is uh, when they landed in the Pacific Ocean, is the crew that picked them up was the USS Hornet. Uh, well, there was a crew on board uh, which um, was being supported, or sorry, the USS Hornet was being supported by a squadron of helicopters known as the Black Knights. Well, the commander of the squadron and the pilot of the helicopter that day happened to be UW-Madison alumni and Madison native uh, Commander Donald Jones. Um, and unfortunately, Commander Jones uh, passed away a couple of years ago, um, but, he was, the, he was the one to help recover them. Another Wisconsin connection is uh, Navy Lieutenant Clancy uh, Hadelberg. Uh, he is from Chippewa Falls, and he's actually, in this picture, he's the guy who's closing uh, the dock, um, and he's the one who provided the astronauts with, the, uh, with their biohazard suits and also essentially bleeps them down uh, because of the risk of contaminants from the moon. Now, we're all familiar with uh, President, or we all may be familiar with President Nixon's, uh, with this picture of President Nixon talking to the astronauts after they returned in their quarantine. In doing a lot of research um, and looking through several papers and articles, um, I'm pretty confident to say that the reason why they were in quarantine is, also has a University of Wisconsin-Madison connection. Uh, so Professor uh, Joshua Lederberg and his wife, Esther Lederberg, uh, were researchers here at the university. Uh, he received the Nobel Prize in 1958 for work on bacterial conjugation, something that they were both researchers on. Uh, do with that information what you will. Um, after the launch of Sputnik in 1957, um, Lederberg became concerned about uh, the risk of humans contaminating space, excuse me, uh, the risk of humans contaminating space and bringing and astronauts bringing back uh, contaminants from other worlds. So he wrote a letter to the National Academy of Sciences, and he made it very clear that, he was, that this was something of concern and something that they should take into consideration. Um, and in 1958, they, sent, uh, they created, or they wrote a official uh, concern letter uh, about this. So again, I'd like to, I would feel comfortable in attributing their quarantine uh, to him. Uh, after that, after they were released from their 21-day quarantine, uh, they were welcomed into the, into the nation, uh, or around the nation, um, as American heroes. Now the program continued uh, with six missions, but only five landings, uh, and I'm sure you know why. Uh, Apollo 12 uh, was an electrifying return to the moon, as I'd like to call it. Uh, this carried uh, Charles Conrad, uh, Richard Gordon, and Alan Bean. 
Uh, the mission was from November 14th uh, to November 24th, uh, just a couple of months after uh, Apollo 11 had touched down. <coughs> this mission actually almost didn't go up. Uh, well, it almost didn't go all the way up, I should say. Um, and the reason behind that is during the, uh, during the launch, by chance, lightning struck the Saturn V twice um, and essentially fried, uh, or not fried, I should say, but uh, turned off all the electronics on the inside. So the astronauts were flying blindly. Uh, from what I understand, they only had about a minute time window before they actually, okay, let's try and figure something out or let's abort and not keep going. Uh, fortunately, they were able to find a solution that uh, one flight controller was happened to remember from a training uh, the, the year before. They, had, <laughs> they ended up making it to the moon successfully and uh, put down the Apollo Lunar Surface uh, Experiments Package, which, as I mentioned, uh, was uh, the earlier version uh, was carried on Apollo 11. Uh, and the goal was, gather, again, to gather information uh, from each uh, landing site. And they also collected pieces of uh, Surveyor 3, which had landed earlier, um, for analysis, and Surveyor 3 is from uh, the Jet Propulsion, if I remember correctly, is, uh, was developed by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which the Solar System Ambassadors is housed by. Then there's unlucky number 13. Uh, <laughs> uh, the mission carried Fred Hayes, uh, Fred Hayes Jr., John Swigert, and James, a uh, James Lavelle Jr., again. Um, <coughs> I was, I made, when I was practicing this, someone told me, you shouldn't say uh, that James Lavelle was unlucky because he still didn't end up making it to the moon, but he still didn't end up making it to the moon, unfortunately. So I'm going to say it anyways. Um, during the launch, uh, or I'm sorry, when they made it into space, uh, there was an explosion in, the, in one of the oxygen tanks on the command and service module, which essentially uh, caused a lot, of, a lot of damage to it. And uh, there was a risk that the astronauts may not make it home. And I know there's a lot more to the story, but in, the, in, the, in terms of time, I'm just going to keep it short. Uh, the crew ended up not making it to the moon, um, and Mission Control had to figure out a way to get the astronauts back home safely. So they were figuring stuff, uh, while, they were, while Mission Control was figuring out how to get them back home uh, here on the ground, the astronauts on board were trying to replicate the same thing. Uh, they ended up using the lunar module kind of as a life raft after hot-wiring hot it because some of the batteries had, had uh, gone down. And after overcoming several challenges, including the loss of navigation system, uh, where they had to use, uh, they basically had to use the sun, stars, and, and the Earth's terminator, which is a division between uh, the day and the night, to actually be able to make it back home. And another little connection I will add is that astronauts for the Apollo program trained at Griffith Observatory using our planetarium um, for, during, uh, during their training. Uh, so again, the crew didn't end up making it uh, to the moon, but they did, uh, thankfully, make it back to Earth uh, four days later. So, Then came Apollo 14, uh, which was the most extensive science, uh, the, the mission with the most extensive sciences. This carried Stuart Rosa, uh, Alan Shepard, and Edgar Mitchell. The launch was January 31st, uh, and it lasted through February 9th, uh, 1971. And Apollo 14, 15, 16, and 17 uh, all became focused on landing the astronauts on various locations of the moon uh, to help gather a variety of rock samples. And Apollo 14 landed on the moon's Fra Mauro <laughs> formation, uh, which is an area that was believed to, uh, have created, to have been created as a result of a collision between the moon and a very large mass. And it happened to end up being a great place to study. Uh, and this was actually the original uh, landing site for Apollo 13 had they made it. Uh, they also studied the um, lunar ionosphere, and they, this time, as opposed to the passive seismic experiment, they used an active seismic experiment, which, allowed them, uh, which provided them information on, on the structure of the uh, top 100 meters of the uh, lunar regolith. In addition to that, uh, uh, Rosa um, took, regional uh, took measurements on regional variations of the gravitational acceleration um, and the, uh, there was also a scattering of the radar that he was doing while he was up on the command module. Another cool thing about this mission <laughs> uh, is they collected a large amount of samples, uh, uh, which was about 97 pounds of rocks, including my personal favorite, Big Bertha, which you guys may be familiar with. Yeah. So it's a very big rock, and I don't think any, oh, well, I don't think any of these are Big Bertha, but, uh, but yeah. Um, and then another favorite moment was Alan Shepard golfing. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> After Apollo 14 uh, came Apollo 15, which included uh, David Scott, Alfred Warden, and James Irwin, and a new, uh, a new member uh, riding along with them, the Lunar Roving Vehicle. Uh, the mission went on from July 26th, uh, so just a little bit over two years after Apollo 11. And this was the first time uh, that, the that the lunar roving vehicle had actually gone up, and it was meant to be used um, on Apollos 15, 16, and 17 as well. This allowed the astronauts to travel a lot farther than uh, a lot farther from the lunar module than uh, previous. And in fact, and on Apollo 14, Alan Shepard set the record for how far for how far away an astronaut had walked away from the lunar module at 9,000 feet. On this mission, on Apollo 15, uh, it allowed the astronauts to go about 17 miles. Um, so yeah, and this uh, Apollo 15 was actually the first of a new type of mission uh, known as an Apollo J mission, uh, where it allowed the astronauts to actually stay longer for almost three days as opposed to a little bit under a day uh, for the previous missions. And another cool video, which I, uh, <laughs> so one of my favorite things about science is that, uh, I mean, I love science a lot, but I love how there's times where you can just do the silliest experiments and it works out. And uh, I love that this is how, I, and I genuinely love that this is how our tax dollars went. In my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago, who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. The feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That is that was the when I saw that I was like, that's the coolest thing ever. Just <laughs> let's drop that. Uh Apollo 16 uh, was the first time that a, bio that a biology experiment had actually been done on the moon. Uh, it carried uh, Ken Mattingly, John Young, and Charles Duke Jr. Uh, this was uh, a couple of months later on April 16th, um, and it lasted through April 27th, 1972. And as I mentioned, it was the first time that a biology experiment had been taken into space. This is known as the BioStack. And the goal of it was to test the biological effects of uh, various heavy uh, cosmic, cosmic particles, essentially, coming from, uh, coming from space that uh, we are, as I mentioned earlier, protected from here on Earth. Um, and this carried, this bio stack actually carried a variety of different uh, organisms and seeds and uh, spores, so like Arabidopsis, um, Bacillus subtilis, so just a variety of experiments, uh, which, was, which I thought was pretty cool being a biologist. Um, and they also uh, were able to, I tried to find the video of John Young roving around. Um, I could not find a decent quality video that wouldn't just be all grady. Um, but they kept on exploring and, also, and continued using uh, the seismic experience and, the, uh, and all the other experiments used on the, in the Apollo package. And finally came Apollo 17, uh, which I like to call not the end. Uh, the mission carried uh, Harrison Schmidt, who uh, was the first and only scientist to travel uh, on the Apollo missions, and is also apparently, I just learned the other day at three in the morning when I couldn't sleep, um, that he is actually an adjunct professor here at the university. Um, so uh, that was pretty neat. Um, it also carried uh, Eugene Cernan and Ronald Evans. And the mission uh, took off December 7th and it landed, came back down on uh, December 19th. And this was the final launch of Apollo. Uh, it was also the most extensive mission uh, where uh, three EVAs were done, or extravehicular activities, sorry. Um, each one was about seven hours, and they were on the moon for uh, a little bit more than three days. Uh, Cernan and Schmidt ended up collecting about 243 pounds worth of material. Um, I mean, it was the last time that who knows until when, well, now we know, at least 50 years, right, um, to, that we'd go back to the moon. Um, and one of the things that... Uh, that um, Schmidt got excited about 
being a geologist, um, is this orange soil that is right here, and uh, you can kind of see it right here. Yeah, it didn't come out as great on the projector. Um, but yeah, so uh, that soil was something that he was super interested in. There's a video where he's like, wow, orange soil, come check this out. And from what I understand, he, uh, he ended up replacing uh, another crew member, and some of the, the two other crew members weren't so excited until they realized that, hey, he's a scientist, awesome. Um, and these samples, uh, as I mentioned earlier, some of them have gone unopened. Uh, they continue to provide more and more information about the moon um, as new tools and techniques are being developed. And with that um, came Cernan and Schmidt's launch from the moon, and they remain the last men to walk on the moon, uh, and no humans have been back since December 14th. Wow, oh, man, why did that video play? There we go. Nine, nine, proceed in three, two, one. And with that was the end of the Apollo missions. Uh, in total, about 33 people, uh, 30, I'm sorry, not about, 33 people flew. Uh, there were six moon landings, uh, 12 astronauts walked on the moon, and over 840, and about 842 pounds of moon rocks were returned. Uh, what we learned from the Apollo missions uh, is that uh, the moon is not a primordial object. Um, it is ancient, uh, and it still preserves an early history of the terrestrial planets. Um, it's the youngest, uh, the youngest moon rocks provided, um, provided us information that told us that they're basically as old as the oldest Earth rocks. And also, um, and unfortunately to astrobiologists, uh, it is lifeless and it contains no living organisms, fossils, or native organic compounds. Um, as, I'm, as you saw me call it, uh, I called it not the end, um, because the moon has never really been the end goal. Um, I was watching, again, as I, I'm going to keep on bringing Walter Cronkite up. I was watching uh, the replay of the coverage, and he had Arthur Clarke, uh, the author of 2001 A Space Odyssey, on as a guest. And it was funny, the Saturn V hadn't even launched yet. It was, I think, like five minutes before it, had, it was launching. And Arthur Clarke was already talking about, yeah, let's, we're, we're going to go to the moon. Um, and that was 50 years ago. And... Well, I mean, we, we haven't been there, obviously, and we haven't been back to the moon. Um, but NASA's next goal, uh, their new campaign, aims to do just that, with a new Explore Moon to Mars campaign. The Moon to Mars campaign uh, will use uh, the space launch system, which, when it, it is developed, uh, will be the most powerful rocket ever developed, even more powerful than, uh, than the Saturn V. Um, and its first launch is estimated to be in 2024. Uh, it will carry the Orion capsule, which is just slightly bigger than the Apollo capsule. If you've ever seen an Apollo capsule, you, you kind of give you a picture of it. Um, and its first mission, uh, and it's, sorry, the goal of it is to, again, carry astronauts to the moon and to Mars, uh, with the first mission being uh, Artemis 1. I was about to call it Exploration Mission 1, but they just changed it to Artemis 1. Um, and if you're not familiar, I believe Artemis 1 is the sister? Twin sister. Twin sister of Apollo. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so yeah, now another goal of NASA is, uh, or to help with the journey to Mars, is um, to actually set up a lunar gateway around the moon. Um, and the goal of this is to actually set up a, a gateway or essentially an orbiting space station that will orbit the moon that'll make it easier for astronauts to launch from the moon and then go on uh, for the journey to Mars. Now before we actually go to Mars, uh, there's several challenges that we need to overcome. Uh, mostly focused on humans, um, such as uh, food, for example. We can't carry it all, uh, and if so, because the journey to Mars is roughly two to three years round trip. So we need to grow this food in space and grow it on Mars. Well, thankfully, here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, there, there have been several, um, several endeavors to, to grow plants in space, uh, including potatoes, uh, which you may be familiar with, spuds in space, uh, rabidopsis, and uh, brachypodium. Now, Another little personal connection is Skylab. Uh, Skylab, uh, the, uh, the first plant experiment, or one of the first plant experiments, was actually done by a student in Downey High, from Downey High School. Um, they were rivals to Warren High School, so I don't give them too much props, but <laughs> nonetheless. Um, but yeah, the, <laughs> the goal was, uh, Donald Schlack uh, proposed an experiment to study rice seeds, and it happened to be so, uh, so similar to uh, Joel Werdekemper's experiment from uh, Nebraska that they actually ended up sending both of them together. And uh, the experiment was done um, again in 1973 aboard Skylab. Then, now coming back to the University of Wisconsin, uh, was spuds in space. 
this flew aboard STS-73 on the Space Shuttle Columbia, uh, which again, unfortunately, uh, perished in 2003. Uh, and this was in 1995, uh, and it carried five uh, potato leaves. And it was the first time that food had ever actually been grown in orbit. And what what it was, and actually, let me go to this picture first, uh, with astronaut uh, Coleman actually planting these, uh, these what you call it, these leaves, um, they actually sprouted tubers. And it was the first time that food had ever actually been grown in space. Um, and Tom made, told me that this is a particular point I should make a point of, <laughs> that it was the University of Wisconsin. Um, now, uh, the cool thing about this is that it opened the doors for a lot of, uh, for a lot of horticulture experiments on board. Um, this was in 1995, I believe is what I said. Um, yeah, 1995, sorry. Um, so it was in 1995, and the goal of it was to, again, be able to grow food in space and test this out for whenever the International Space Station was built, which wouldn't happen for at least another three years. Um, not only with the goal of, one, creating food for the astronauts, but also uh, acting as a, natural, as a natural recycling system, essentially, uh, where it, the plants would absorb the oxygen, they would, or I'm sorry, absorb the carbon dioxide, release oxygen, and purify water uh, by transpiration. Then a second experiment that went up into space from the university uh, was the fast Wisconsin fast plants, or Brassica rapa. Uh, and these flew, uh, these were on board Mir. This was actually two years later. And this succession, uh, though the experiment itself was not uh, run by the university, the, this succession was actually created here at, the, here at the university. And what's cool about these particular plants is that they have a life cycle of about 45 days, uh, making them ideal for use in space because astronauts only have so much time to dedicate to a particular experiment, right? Uh, there's so many experiments that go on that you only get a certain time window, and if you miss that time window, then it's done. Uh, another cool thing about this is that you can actually buy them online. <laughs> um, I tried to buy some, and it and is, I don't know if it let me or not, or I just wasn't, I'm not, a, I'm not good with plants. That's why I study bacteria. Um, so, but yeah. Uh, and these actually had a part two. So in, uh, S, on STS-87, uh, the, uh, the plants or the fast plant seeds went up again, uh, and this time it was part of an educational component uh, where school, ch uh, school children around the U.S. and in the Ukraine, um, over 500,000 students, I believe, uh, were, growing, were growing these plants in their own classrooms to help mirror the experiments that were going on aboard uh, the space shuttle. Then finally, the International Space Station. Its construction began in 1998. Um, and it was a new place uh, to grow, pl to study plants under microgravity. And two groups here at the University of Wisconsin uh, currently take advantage of that. Uh, the first, which you, uh, you may be familiar with, is the Gilroy Lab. They are in the Department of Botany. Uh, and it's, uh, they've had four launches so far with more in the pipeline, including one uh, this year uh, around Christmas time and one potentially next year, uh, early next year. But uh, as you all know, space is difficult, so sometimes that may change, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> um, now, I'm going to be focusing on their most recent experiment that launched, which was aboard SpaceX a commercial resupply mission, uh, commercial supply service mission uh, number 13 that launched on December 13th, uh, 2017. There. Now, the goal uh, in, during this mission, the, the group sent up a Ravidopsis taliana, uh, and the goal of it was to test, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and remember the name, it's for the test of a Ravidopsis uh, space transcriptome, or TOAST. And I genuinely thought about bringing a piece of toast on here just to act as a, <laughs> uh, just as a prop. Uh, now, if you're not familiar, the transcriptome is essentially the set of genes that are being expressed in an organism. And this, uh, this grew. Uh, this, uh, the goal of this was to actually see how or what the genetic and molecular stress res response was in space. Because the group had noticed that, uh, board the, uh, that while they're growing on board the International Space Station, for whatever reason, they weren't getting enough oxygen and they uh, were exhibiting a stress response. Uh, and the lab sent up a variety of, uh, a variety of strains, or I'm sorry, uh, accessions. So wild type strain and, uh, and other, others as well. And uh, here you can see uh, Canadian Space Agency astronaut David Sanjak um, growing this. And then this is actually inside of the veggie um, component aboard the space station. And the veggie component was also produced here in Madison, uh, developed by uh, Orbital Technologies, also known as Orbitech. And uh, unlike everything, excuse me, unlike everything else that NASA makes, it doesn't have an acronym. So veggie doesn't stand anything. It's just called veggie. Um, so. 
And this uh, was also used for, uh, to grow space lettuce, which made a lot of news uh, when Scott Kelly was aboard the space station. And thanks to my good friends over at the uh, Gilroy Astrobotany Laboratory, uh, they were able to share some videos that, uh, to test you all. So can you tell me which ones were the ones that grew on Earth and which ones were the ones that grew up in space? So left, left was what? Earth. Earth, okay. And then so then right is in space. And that's correct because you can tell that on these, yeah, the roots, exactly. So the roots were growing straight downward, where aboard the plants that grew on board the International Space Station were kind of a little wonky. <laughs> well, in following with the Wisconsin idea, the Groot, uh, which to produce, to do outreach with knowledge that's being learned here at the university throughout the Wisconsin and the world, um, the group actually made their, all their TOAST data, uh, all the transcriptomics open access. So anyone who's interested in this data can actually go online to their website uh, on astrobotany.com or you can use the QR code if you'd like. So if someone wants to try that out, um, you can go in and download all this data and access it and uh, play around with it. And also following along with the Wisconsin idea, the group, uh, there we go. The group dis, uh, developed this, uh, this device, which is called a, a 3D clinostat. And basically what it does is it, um, it, randomizes, uh, it randomizes gravity. Um, so anything that's in growing inside, like plants, microbes, uh, you know, embryos or stem cells, something like that, um, they don't have a sense of gravity. And the group is particularly excited because they're actually the first to integrate lights and to integrate camera. So they can look at what effect, uh, and there's some of the lights right there, they can actually look at to what effect uh, the, the different light uh, variables are, are playing. Onto these, uh, onto these plants or whatever they're growing in there. Um, and again, this the goal in following along with the Wisconsin idea, uh, the group is hopefully planning on uh, using this experiment with uh, students around the country, or around, at least around Madison, uh, so they can replicate the TOAST data. And one of their, uh, there we go, and uh, one of the group's upcoming, upcoming missions, uh, with a little sneak preview, uh, is TikTok or the targeting improves cotton through, through orbital cultivation. Uh, and this is in partnership with Target. And the goal of this is to uh, understand how uh, cotton grows up in space. Uh, so um, now going from Arabidopsis to, to hopefully understanding cotton. Now a second group that, uh, that does uh, work in space here at the, university, in, at the university, and particularly in my home department, is the lab of Patrick Masson. His group launched uh, aboard on Ape launched Apex Six um, along. Uh, so it's uh, Patrick and his uh, co-investigator uh, Shi Hing Su, and um, this is a picture of them at Kennedy Space Center that they uh, thankfully provided to me. Now they sent up a uh, Brachypodium. Uh, the reason why they sent up Brachypodium, or the, the goal behind understanding it, is it's a major. It's a model for all major uh, crops that uh, that are monocots. Sorry. Uh, so some of these, for example, other monocots are barley, uh, oats, and wheat. Now, the reasoning behind doing the study is, yes, there's a lot of data from Arabidopsis, but Arabidopsis is a dicot. So it's unclear whether the, that data can actually be extrapolated to, uh, to monocots. Now, the, uh, the, the group's mission launched aboard a SpaceX uh, resupply mission number 14. Uh, with three questions. One, will they grow at all? Uh, because it was the first time that Brachypodium had ever been sent up to space. Um, and also, uh, would there be differences between ground control and the ISS growth? And uh, what are the growth and transcriptomic responses? And here you can actually see a video of, uh, of astronaut Scott Tingle um, injecting, uh, injecting the media. And actually, they were awesome enough to lend me this. So this is a, a space rated uh, device to actually be able to grow their brachypodium plants. So basically what it does, what you can do, or what they do, I should say, is they insert at least, uh, or at most, I should say, six um, brachypodium seeds onto each side that have been surface sterilized. Now the goal behind that, or the goal behind this, is with a rabbit opsis, you use a particular uh, wavelength of light to make sure that it doesn't, um, to make sure it doesn't germinate before it gets into space. Well, it turns out that that same wavelength of light um, actually activates germination in Brachypodium. <laughs> of course, right? Um, so uh, the goal of this was to, uh, as you can see in the, in the video down on the bottom, the goal of it is that it, the, the plants remain dry and then the astronaut 
connects a tube under here and actually uh, injects the BDM into there uh, and rehydrating them. At the same time, uh, while the astronauts were doing their uh, experiment up on the space station, the, the group did uh, the experiment, replicated the experiment here on Earth, and there was a delay of two days in the way that they grew their experiment to time, uh, to time along with uh, the way that the experiment was being done aboard the space station. And again, they were awesome enough to provide me some pictures. Uh, so can you tell which one is the one? This one's maybe a little harder to tell. Can you tell me which one is the one that is was grown in space, which one was grown here on Earth? Right of space? All right, yeah, awesome. So yeah, so the ones that, that were grown on the right, uh, or that, uh, that are on the right were grown aboard the uh, International Space Station. Um, and I should mention that they actually grew uh, three different accessions uh, that had a very, uh, which basically three different strains of uh, Brachypodium, and that's because they all show different growth profiles. And then here's another little close-up. That's pretty awesome. And this is the group's first mission, and they hope to, to launch uh, some more. Now, uh, aside from plants, <laughs> uh, aside from plants, we actually need to take care of these space farmers, right? So we need to understand what does microgravity and what does living in space, uh, what effect does that have on, on astronauts? Uh, because, again, the journey to Mars is two to three years, so they're going to be living out there for a long time. So the human research program, uh, part of a NASA program, has been studying this with uh, focusing on five different hazards uh, to humans, uh, including microgravity, isolation, because I mean, you're in a tight space with only three other people for two years. Um, so I hope you like them. Uh, hostile environments, radiation, and the distance from Earth. Um, so these are the five focuses that NASA has. And these uh, were actually also the focuses of a, mission, or of a study that you may all may be familiar with, which is the NASA twin study. Uh, the NASA twin study uh, was, uh, happened in 2015, and it focused on astronaut Scott Kelly and astronaut Mark Kelly. NASA is lucky enough to have two twin, or to have twin astronauts in, the, in their group. So Scott went up to space uh, for 340 days. He launched on March 28, 2015, while uh, Mark stayed here on Earth. Excuse me. And this is actually part of a part of the uh, one year mission, which also included uh, Mikhail Kordienko, uh, and he was also in space for about 340 days. And throughout the, the whole time, they, they, uh, at, while, they, while they were up in space, uh, Mark here on Earth was taking the same measurements. He was basically kind of eating the same things, uh, doing the same exercises, so they can have a one to one comparison. Scott and uh, Mikhail eventually returned on March 1st, 2016, having spent uh, 340 days uh, aboard the space station. Now, uh, with this, this was, uh, as I mentioned, a part of the NASA twin study, which uh, incorporated 10 different research areas. And after a couple of years, which I was finally excited, the paper was finally published. Uh, it was a summary paper that was published in April of this year. Um, so uh, that data is out there. But it's a, it's a 22 page paper, so I'm not gonna give you all the results, um, but I will give you uh, some of the, the top three. First is telomeres. So there, they noticed a change in Scott's telomeres where, uh, so what, sorry, what telomeres are is that every time that the cell replicates, these shorten a little bit, they act to protect the chromosomes. Um, well, they noticed that for whatever reason, uh, in Scott, they actually lengthened while he was up in space. Uh, now, does that necessarily mean that he got younger? And that is a picture of, of Scott and Mark from when they were three years old. Not necessarily, um, because once he actually returned to, to, to Earth, uh, they continued doing uh, studies on him and they found that they just basically went back to normal. Uh, another, another major result was their immune system. So you can see that both uh, Scott and Mark were injecting themselves with the flu vaccine to test what their immune system response was, and it turns out it was basically the same. Uh, so awesome, perfect, right? <laughs> um, and then the last one was they noticed changes in gene expression. Now that's not changes in the actual genes. When the story came out, there was a lot of like, wait, so the genes were changed or what was it? But no, it was just simply the way that, the, that, their, that their genes were expressed, so how they were being produced, or how the protein was being produced. Um, and they also noticed that, they, uh, that Scott, so he, sorry, he had changes in his gene expression, but in addition to that, they also found that there was a lot of DNA damage. And one of the, one of the causes of DNA damage in particular is radiation. And being up in space, you're exposed to a lot more radiation than you are here on Earth. Um, his, uh, the majority of the changes in his gene expression returned back to normal after some time, uh, but he still ended up with a lot of DNA damage. And uh, for a lot of these results, uh, NASA isn't necessarily sure what the longer term effects are. Now, 
in science, you don't just do an N of one, right? <laughs> Uh, you want to have at least three, at least three replicates or more than that. You know, otherwise you won't get published, right? Um, so, um, so yeah. So, uh, NASA's future directions for the Human Research Program is that they will actually be. Uh, they've actually already proposed to replicate uh, this study, not unfortunately with another set of twins, but just in general with other astronauts to replicate what they're doing up in uh, up in space and then here on Earth and take measurements. And in addition to that. Um, because generally they only stay up there for, I mean, at this point now, a year. Um, what NASA is planning on doing is taking measurements or having astronauts uh, focus on one month, six months, and a year long so they can actually extrapolate that data and figure out how quickly and when are those changes occurring. And finally, um, I'd like to just say and share NASA's message uh, that we are indeed going back to the moon and we are indeed hopefully going back to Mars. Uh, or sorry, not going back, going to Mars, <laughs> uh, and uh, hopefully going back to the moon by 2024. And I'll close with this video. 50 years ago, we pioneered a path to the moon. The trail we blazed, cut through the fictions of science, and showed us all what was possible. Today, our calling to explore is even greater. To go farther, we must be able to sustain missions of greater distance and duration. We must use the resources we find at our destinations. We must overcome radiation, isolation, gravity, and extreme environments like never before. These are the challenges we face to push the bounds of humanity. We're going to the moon to stay by 2024, and this is how. This all starts with the ability to get larger, heavier payloads off planet and beyond Earth's gravity. For this, we design an entirely new rocket. The Space Launch System. SLS will be the most powerful rocket ever developed. And with components in production. And more in testing. This system is capable of being the catalyst for deep space missions. We need a capsule that can support humans from launch through deep space and return safely back to Earth. For this, we've built Orion. This is NASA's next generation human space capsule. Using data from lunar orbiters that continue to reveal the moon's hazards and resources, we're currently developing an entirely new approach to landing and operating on the moon. Using our commercial partners to deliver science instruments and robotics to the surface, we are paving the way for human missions in 2024. Our charge is to go quickly and stay press our collective efforts forward with a fervor that will see us return to the moon in a manner that is wholly different than 50 years ago. We want lunar landers that are reusable, that can land anywhere on the lunar surface. The simplest way to do so is to give them a platform in orbit around the moon from which to transition. An orbiting platform to host deep space experiments and be a waypoint for human capsules. We call this lunar outpost Gateway. The beauty of the Gateway is that it can be moved between orbits. It will balance between the Earth and Moon's gravity. In a position that is ideal for launching even deeper space missions. In 2009, we learned that the Moon contains millions of tons of water ice. This ice can be extracted and purified for water. It can be separated in oxygen for breathing or hydrogen for rocket fuel. The Moon is quite uniquely suited to prepare us and propel us to Mars and beyond. This is what we are building. This is what we're training for. This we can replicate throughout the solar system. This is the next chapter of human space exploration. Humans are the most fragile element of this entire endeavor, and yet we go for humanity. We go to the moon and onto Mars to seek knowledge and understanding and to share it with all. We go knowing our efforts will create opportunities that cannot be foreseen. We go because we are destined to explore and see it with our own eyes. We turn towards the moon now, not as a conclusion, but as preparation, as a checkpoint toward all that lies beyond. Our greatest adventures remain ahead of us. We are going. We're going. We are going. We are going. We're going. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions.
Yes. And what are the people going to do that Rovers can't? I'm sorry? What are the people going to do that Rovers can't? So the question is, what are people going to do that Rovers can't? So, uh, well, with Rovers, it's a little difficult because there's a time delay between, uh, obviously, between Mars and here, we can just simply due to the distance. So it's hard to create a rover that will do, that is essentially a geologist uh, or a chemist or a biologist on, on, uh, on Mars. Uh, so it's really the aspect of being there and being able to take control of what's going on and not necessarily having to develop a rover that will be able to do all those things. And also, I mean, it's just awesome to go to Mars, so why not? <laughs> yes. So when you're describing the Apollo series, there were like a couple that were two or three months apart. Yeah. So how much of any of that equipment was used from one mission to the next? Um, you know, that's, that's a good question. So the so yeah, so the question was how much of the uh, Apollo or of the Saturn V was reused um, throughout throughout the missions. Uh, to be quite honest, I'm not totally sure. I would make, like to make an educated guess that almost none of it was reused. And the reason I say that is because a lot of the capsules, for example, are on display in various museums. Um, so I would, I would bet money that, uh, that none of them were reused. So, yeah. I mean, what is a gravity randomizing device? So <laughs> I see you're wearing an astrobotany hat. <laughs> so yeah, so the question is, uh, what, is a, what, a, what is a gravity randomizing device? So essentially what it is is because that, is, that, that, uh, that device is spinning, uh, that because that device is spinning, the, whatever's inside isn't necessarily feeling the effects of gravity. And that's about as much as I know. So if you have a better question, if you have a better response, I can, I can share that. <laughs> I, I, I call the uh, bottle of Jim Beam. The what? <laughs> <laughs> I would too. <laughs> yes. Um, before they go to Mars, are they planning on you know, um, maybe remotely landing supplies, fuel, oxygen, and all that kind of stuff? So, okay, so the question was uh, before astronauts go to Mars, is there a plan to actually land uh, supplies and things like that? Uh, I have to be pretty honest that as far as I understand, the plan hasn't been developed that far out. Um, there are private companies that uh, have plans like, like that uh, who are planning on uh, potentially getting to Mars sooner than NASA will. Um, and that's simply because they have the liberty of more funding. And if you're not familiar, NASA has very little funding. So if you ever have a chance to vote for NASA gets more funding, please do so. Um, but yeah, so uh, I don't believe that the missions have been planned out that far, that far out. In fact, uh, Artemis 1, um, and the gateway was just recently announced uh, in the past year or two. Yes. First of all, I love the talk. Thank you. I'm a big science fan. Thank you. Awesome. I, since I love, I love science so much, mm -hmm. do you have any advice for people my age who yeah. want to get into science? Okay, so the question was for younger people, um, well, how, um, how can they become involved in science with the goal of, of uh, becoming astronauts eventually? Um, the biggest thing that I would say is don't let yourself get discouraged. Um, I, that may not be the, the best answer, but I would say don't let yourself get discouraged. Um, there's, science is hard. Uh, traveling into space is hard, but it's not impossible. Um, I can share with you, um, it, again, I'm sorry, it's not the best advice, but I'll share a personal story. Um, after my second year of community college, I thought about quitting science, uh, simply because I didn't think I was good enough, but I kept going, um, because I simply fell in love with it. Um, now, in terms of uh, to become an astronaut, uh, there's only, like, I think three physical requirements uh, for you to, to become an astronaut. Um, but the best way is to stick into a, into a, stay in the science field. So whether that be biology, whether that be chemistry, um, whether that be you know, physics, for example, uh, you could also decide to go and be a pilot. Um, a lot of these astronauts are uh, Navy pilots and Air Force pilots, and that's where they got their start. Um, so really my best piece of advice is uh, don't let yourself get discouraged. Um, 
again, science is hard and uh, your interests are gonna change. Uh, for a long time, I thought I was so sure I was going to study depression um, because it was something that I was super interested in for several years and now I study bacteria. So, <laughs> uh, because I've ended up falling in love with a different field this time progressed. So, um, I'm sorry if that's not the best advice, but, uh, but it's what I, what I have, so, yeah. Well, a follow up to that person's question as far as an answer. My son is one of the being asked tonight, he's now 34, and, uh, rolling along, but when he was 18, getting ready to go to a military academy, he met with one of the space shuttle astronauts and asked that astronaut, what is the best way to become an astronaut? And uh, this astronaut had been on, uh, I think, uh, two shuttle missions. And he said his answer was, as a young person, find an area you're passionate in, an area in science you're passionate in, and there'll be a spot for you in space. Yeah. So find an area you're passionate in, get very good at it, and there'll be a spot. Yeah. And I will add also that you're at the right age uh, to potentially be the first person on, on Mars. So <laughs> I'm just going to throw that out there. Yeah, sorry. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure, yeah. I wanted to be the first person on Mars, but that's not going to happen, I don't think. Um, yes, sorry. There are other countries interested in space exploration. Correct. Uh, yeah, so, so China did recently land on, uh, on the far side of the moon. Uh, so they, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to, that. I didn't mean to just going to say that. But uh, the question was, uh, were, or have there been other countries that, have, that, are, that are interested in space exploration? And yes, uh, one example was China. They just recently landed aboard uh, on the other side of the, the far side of the moon um, using their lander, which I'm going to butcher the name, but I believe is uh, Chang'e 2. Um, and uh, so that's one group. Um, the, um, India is also improving their uh, space exploration program. And in fact, they were just about to launch um, a lander on the South Pole or attempt a lander on the South Pole. Um, unfortunately, the mission got scrubbed, so it's, uh, it's a little delayed. Um, uh, Japan is also uh, increasing their studies. Uh, Russia has always been our, our competitor, um, and uh, the Europeans uh, as well. So, so yeah, there's several, uh, several countries. Yes. Is there any cooperation? Uh, there is cooperation amongst a majority of the countries. The country that uh, things have been easing up, uh, but uh, there has been, no, I wouldn't say conflicts, but not cooperation, at least not cooperation, uh, would be China. Uh, so China decided that they wouldn't go aboard the International Space Station, which is why they decided to build their own, um, which I believe they're currently on the second, on their second space station. Um, but yeah, that's one of the countries that I know that there hasn't been much cooperation with. I think things have been improving uh, recently, but yeah. Is there a treaty for a non-military activity? <laughs> Uh, so the question was, is there a treaty for non-military uh, non use of space and uh, space force, right? Um, to be quite honest, I, I believe there is. Uh, there are several treaties uh, about how, you, uh, how space can be used. And I believe there is an agreement that space won't be used for, for warfare. Um, but, you know, things change and things don't, people don't always follow treaties. But. Yeah. That's just my unofficial opinion. <laughs> Let me hide this. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, do you know if they've done any like zoology experiments on the highest? Awesome question. I love, I love, I love biology experiments. Uh, so yeah. So sorry. So the question was, have they done any zoology experiments? Um, there have been. You know, I'm not sure if there's anything zoology specific, but there have been a lot of. Uh, Human, <laughs> Tom says humans. Yeah, but there have been a lot of there have been a lot of organisms that have gone up to space. There have been reptiles, frogs, mice, uh, fruit flies, C. elegans. You know, you name it. The, the, um, it's probably gone up there. Uh, one thing in particular, though, that hasn't been studied is um, uh, organism being born in space. Uh, so at least a mammal being born in space. So that's something that's of interest to NASA because I mean, obviously, if we're going to be doing these deep space missions. And going out into uh, potentially uh, colonizing Mars, then you know, how's that going to work? We don't know yet. <laughs> yes. Have any crops by any countries? Yes. Experiments uh, been grown from seed to fruition to use as food in space. Yes, I believe the fast plants were. 
the the yeah so the wisconsin fast plants at least because they they were up there for so uh their life cycles 45 days but they were up there for a couple of months so yeah so those were some and in fact uh, something i forgot to mention is that uh the astronaut who was working on that experiment he even used a bee thorax to actually uh pollinate um pollinate plants so that was pretty cool let me over here sorry Yeah. So the question is, uh, what about the concern of radiation? So that is that is a big concern. Um, I'm not totally familiar. You, you, you're probably right about the, the about the risk in terms of cardiovascular. Um, I do know that at least in terms of radiation, for example, like what happened with Scott was DNA damage, which could lead to, to cancer, for example. Um, so it is a concern. Um, in terms of on board the ISS, generally, for example, whenever there's a Whenever there's a solar storm, they tend to get behind a lot of equipment to help. Yeah, it's, it's, it's silly, but yeah, they tend to end up getting behind a lot of equipment to help to basically add extra layers. So it is a, it is a thing of concern, especially uh, for the journey to Mars. So a lot of, uh, you know, without naming names, there's a lot of companies that want to go to Mars before we even know what the full effects are. Um, and that's one of them. As I mentioned, Mars ha doesn't, have a, doesn't have a magnetic field and it doesn't have an atmosphere that protects it like here, like here on Earth that we're protected from the solar wind and from radiation. So one of the concerns is either, you know, we're gonna have to live underground or we're gonna have to, when we terraform, uh, develop all these structures to help protect us from that radiation. But that is definitely a, a big concern and probably one of the top concerns. So, yes. You mentioned several people who participate in the Apollo 11 program. Yes. You did mention one person about uh, four days ago. I was reading the Wall Street Journal. Okay. <clears throat> they had profiled, they said, three heroes of the Apollo 11 program. <clears throat> one of them was from Fort Atkinson. Oh, okay. And his name was Wolfram. Okay. And he joined, the Navy, he became a Navy SEAL, and he boarded the ship. Normally, a ship is there trying to uh, find out where it's likely to land. Yeah. So he swam from the ship, and he boarded uh, 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 on top of the Apollo, and he was the first guy to open the latch. And they had a big bio of him in the Wall Street Journal as to how he did all these work in the Apollo 11 program. And afterwards, he was sent to Vietnam. He did two tours of Vietnam. And during the second tour, he was shot in the leg. Oh. And oh. then after he was severely injured and all, he tried to commit suicide. Oh. And That's then unfortunate. he said something told him not to do that. And then he turned over. And uh, so it's a very interesting story of what he did. And he said, initially, I did because I, I wanted to do something for my country. So first tour, he thought it was his mission to help the country. Yeah. When he came back, he was disillusioned. Uh, but still, he went with a big heart, but he still went. Then he got a purple heart after he came back. So I thought his story also we may have to mention. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sorry that I didn't share that, but thank no, you for sharing that. I, pre I appreciate it. Yeah, so thank you for sharing that. I, I appreciate it. And for so everyone here can, can hear that. So thank you for that. Yes. How many astronauts will be on Artemis 1? On Artemis, uh, so actually, I don't believe Artemis 1 will be manned. Uh, but the uh, Orion capsule can only uh, carry four astronauts. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you all again. Uh, I believe that was the last of the Thank you all again. Um, if you came in through this side, there's stickers and cookies over here. A lot of NASA's, NASA goodies. Um, and uh, there's a moon background so you can take a picture there. And uh, thank you all again for coming. It was really an honor.